Welcome to this video on the Davison-Germer experiment. We're going to explore this very famous experiment that supported the de Broglie hypothesis, which is where we ended the last video. So let's jump in right there and take a look at this really cool and strange um, ex uh, physical phenomenon. So we've been talking about this idea that photons make up light and light remember is a collective for electromagnetic waves and what we saw was that these things had what we are now going to refer to as wave particle duality which basically means that the photon or these little energy amounts of light can exhibit properties of waves which include um, and I'm going to just pick the two most important ones for right now, diffraction and interference. And we saw that they could also exhibit particle-like behaviors. So they had some kind of momentum and they could interact with matter. And that was found through the Compton scattering experiment and also that um, photoelectric effect experiment. Well, we, we found that the energy of the photon or the energy of the light um, could be calculated and is directly proportional to the frequency of the light. And the energy is also directly proportional to the momentum of the light. So Louis de Broglie put these two ideas together and also in, ter in um, terms of the speed of light here, he was able to make a substitution and show effectively that the wavelength is equal to h over p. Now this is important because what he's insinuating here is that if something has momentum it can have a wavelength. So if a photon can have momentum and therefore exhibit particle-like behavior then why can't an electron, which is what we usually assume to have to be made of matter, right? Why can't an electron then also exhibit wave particle duality? And in his PhD dissertation, he proposed that idea. And what he said was you could find the matter wavelength for a particle with a mass m and a speed v which is the substitution of momentum. Now in the last video we looked at the what would the wavelength be for a baseball moving at a certain speed and it happened to be a very tiny number. Now the Davison-Germer experiment which is going to help solidify this idea is in basic form over here. I have a little bit more of a detailed image at the top but basically what we have here is an electron gun and the electron gun essentially gets electrons from rest up to a speed uh, by attaching them across some sort of potential difference here. Those electrons then travel in a beam, so basically in a stream of electrons. So this is not light, this is actually just moving electrons. And they're going to hit a nickel crystal. And that's going to become very important in a minute. The observation was then through this movable detector over here that electrons were deflecting off of the nickel crystal, but not only that, they were actually diffracting through the crystal. And we're going to see how that's possible here in a minute. So let's go ahead and calculate how much velocity the electrons have across the electron gun. Now we've actually inadvertently already done that um, in an earlier um, electrostatics and, and electrodynamics videos. And what we showed was that the work that the electric field that's set up across the gun does is Q times delta V, which is E, the charge of the electron, times the potential difference. We also saw that through the work energy theorem that we could calculate the change in kinetic energy of a particle 
by calculating the amount of work done. So we know it's starting from rest here, and we're going to say that E delta V, or charge times voltage, is equal to one-half mass times velocity squared. That leaves us, if we solve for velocity, with root 2E delta V over M. So if I plug in these specific values for an electron, let's go ahead and do that really quickly here, we know that the electron's elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th, and we're just looking at the magnitude of the charge here. Let's just make this uh, voltage across here 100 volts. Okay, and then we're going to put the mass of the electron in, which is about 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st, so extremely tiny. And the voltage that I calculate here, I'm sorry, the velocity that I calculate here is about 5.9 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Now that velocity is going to go in here for us to be able to calculate the wavelength of an electron that's moving at this particular speed. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to get the wavelength here in a minute by plugging in Planck's constant, which is 6.63 approximately, times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds, and we're going to divide that by the mass of the electron and um, the velocity of the electron, which we just found. And if you put this all into your calculator, what you end up getting is about 1.2 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. So this is the extremely tiny wavelength of an electron. But in the grand scheme of matter, that's actually a very large wavelength compared to the wavelength of things like baseballs and things of very large masses and low velocities. So if we take a look at this, it's a very distinct number in relation to the nickel crystal. They didn't just pick this because it has a cool name. In fact, remember when we talked about the comparison between the wavelength of the light and the spacing size, so the spacing of the diffraction grating or substance or crystal, whatever it may be, if these are approximately the same in size, then we will see diffraction. And it turns out that the spacing between the nickel atoms here is about one times ten to the negative tenth. Um, yeah, one times ten to the negative tenth meters. Now this this distance is oftentimes referred to as an angstrom. We use that uh, symbol here, and it can also be written as um, 0.1 nanometers if you're trying to get some sort of reference here. So 0.1 nanometers. Well, this is about 0.12 nanometers. They're almost the same size. And what we saw happen was one of the weirdest things ever. Here's an image of the pattern that forms from the, di the diffraction of the electrons. Now, how this formed is going to follow the same basic procedure of interference and diffraction. Now what happens here is we have some electrons hit here at the bottom on the second row and some hit on the top row and when they bounce back up sorry my drawings a little bit skewed but when they bounce back up these electrons that are coming off at distinctly different places here when they show up on the detector we're going to see an interference pattern and for different voltages, so different speeds, therefore, that the electrons are moving at, we're going to see these very bright bands show up at very specific locations on the detector. And as the detector moves either way, we see a very big drop off and, and other places where there are electrons detected and other places where they're not. And the intensity of the electrons on this detector are actually greater in certain locations and dim or nothing in other locations. We see some very distinct bands here of where the electron pattern is happening.
Now, it's important to note that all of this part of the experiment here is in a vacuum chamber. So all the particles that are moving here are not interacting with other things. And this vacuum chamber was actually a vacuum tube, or it almost looked like a light bulb. It has a round edge on one side if we were looking at the light bulb head on. So the, the little um, filament was in there and the back of the light bulb was kind of going into the page. We would see that electron diffraction pattern on the edge of the light bulb. And the crazy thing here is that the spacing of the nickel crystal matched the electron uh, wavelength. And when you change the speed of the electron, you could actually predict the angle at which it was going to bounce back. And there was a distinct relationship between the velocity of the electron and the wavelength of the electron and the angle at which it hit. So if we think about the idea of path difference, d sine theta equals m lambda, we can see that the spacing difference here, which for um, this crystal we're actually going to make it 2d sine theta because they're bouncing off two different rows here, that that would actually predict that the interference of the electrons could happen as either constructive with each other or destructive interference depending on M. And so basically what we get here is our bright central spot and our light and dark alternating spots that could be very much predicted with the de Broglie wavelength. So the experimental evidence of this um, Davison-Germer experiment, experiment showed that if the voltage on the anode was increased, the energy of the electrons would be increased, and the diameter of the given ring would get smaller. So we would see those changes. And this is exactly similar to the observation that blue light is diffracted less strongly than red light. Then that arises because the blue light has a smaller wavelength than the red light, which is very cool. So electrons at a higher speed make for smaller um, diffraction rings than electrons at a greater speed. The experiment path difference was measured um, to be very, very close to the actual predicted diffraction. And so we could say that de Broglie's hypothesis was supported by the Davison-Germer experiment. One side note to remember is that G.P. Thompson did an, a similar experiment and got similar results independently of Davison and Germer, and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics.